Yes, welcome everyone to our Friday night reading series. This is a reading series put on by the MFA in Writing and Publishing program here at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. We are the only residential program that, are, that is here on campus. Um, however, because of the pandemic, we're doing all of our programming virtually. So, um, so it's, it's kind of uh, lovely to do that because we have audience members from all around the United States and around the world who are here with us tonight, uh, along with our faculty, students, and larger Montpelier community. So, um, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, we will be recording this event. So um, I ask that all the audience members uh, stay on mute. If you have a question or comment, you can put it in the chat. And of course, you can raise your hand during the Q&A. Um, our readers will be reading for about 15 to 20 minutes each. Uh, we'll do some virtual applauses between uh, the readers. And uh, at the end of our session, we will have a Q&A with all of our writers uh, here tonight. So if you have a question or a comment, or you just want to say hello, um, definitely you know, stick around for the Q&A at the end. Um, our readers tonight include both faculty, staff, and visiting writers. We have a faculty member, Tim Horvath, who will be reading tonight. Uh, Lizzie Fox, our former as associate director, will be reading tonight. And she has a new book out, so we're excited to have her. Um, Pragiti Sharma, who is a wonderful poet and a visiting writer in our program, will be reading tonight, as will our current assistant director, Xin Yi Pai. So we're excited to have all of them. Um, here tonight, Shinyi will actually be co-hosting this event with me tonight, and we will be putting information regarding each of our writers' books in the chat, so please do check them out. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our assistant director, Shinyi Pai, who will introduce our first reader. So, Shinyi. Our uh, first reader tonight will be Lizzie Fox. Lizzie Fox's poetry has appeared in the Greensboro Review, Hunger Mountain, Santa Ana River Review, and elsewhere. Lizzie's first full length collection, Red List Blue, was just published by Finishing Line Press earlier this year. Lizzie holds an MFA in writing from BCFA and worked for three years in the MFA in writing and publishing program. And has taught poetry and public speaking workshops in schools around the state. It's great to have you back, Lizzie. Thank you, Shinyun. I'm really excited to get to uh, share the space with you tonight and hear your work as, as with you, Tim and Pragita. Um, yeah, just so happy to be here. So thanks for having me back, Rita. Always a pleasure to see everyone. And I'm going to just hop in. Um, this is a poem called Almost. We are tender. Only fools watch from a porch while meteorites the size of thumbnails fall quiet each one glowing like a soft torch. They singe the lawn before they quit, scorch the dirt, then no more than fallen marbles. We are tender fools enclosed in a porch. Your nose presses into my cheek, forehead forced on my temple. Fingers hold the hollow of my throat. Each point glows quiet, a torch. The lights are leaving. I want to wind a course through their shower, catch them like fallen flakes on my tender tongue. Fools on a porch. While neighbors dance under a lit sky, you pour a whisper. Hold me easy as a lie about beauty. All your fingers glow quiet. Everything is torched. I don't love you. Certain as stone that source of knowing in my belly, a weight appalled. We are too tender. Only fools watch from a porch while the sky glows quiet like a soft guiding torch. I've picked out a lot of my love poems for tonight. I don't know if it's the we just got past Valentine's Day, or I just want to, I just had my book launch last week and I picked a very different couple of threads. So I, I wanted to pull out the ones I hadn't just read. <laughs> so, this is my last lover asked me if I was an insomniac. But I just couldn't sleep there under skylights, floor to ceiling windows, reaching up to the third loft where he'd perched the bed, 
tree branches and light pollution gray around us like the sun was still out behind clouds. I rose naked and stood by the banister, looking over his strange city, feeling like a mayor's wife or a millionaire. I thought I could get used to it, the opulence, his iridescent gaze. When he looked, I thought, I am held in beauty, held in place by soft, wide wings, trying to assure me his charm was more than just the right notes. It was silent when he slept. He fell in fast, rolled away from me in slumber, kept his hands to himself, a space of air between our bodies. I sang like a bird in mourning when finally he rolled back stiff and ready, wanting to know what thoughts had kept me up. Slant Light. Um, this poem actually I wrote, gosh, I had, it was during a residency for the low residency MFA in writing here at VCFA. Um, and I think I had come back as a graduate at that point. I don't think I was a student, but I sat in on a lecture and um, Bob Vivian gave a prompt where he, um, that was kind of based around this line from a Mary Rufel poem. So that, um, that line appears as an epigraph in the poem. So this is called Slant Light. And the epigraph reads, tonight is the night of the full untrustworthy moon. Very rueful. My mother outside our yellow house, her boots punching through snow as she walks slowly further. Or is it my father pointing to the lunar eclipse holding my shoulders and smiling even as he sighs in that loud way of his, warming his voice for a tired solo, a ragged lament. She left him then, or asked him to leave, or was it I who wandered off? Tonight is the night, she said, and either way, we scattered. I imagine my eyes as yellow as the light slanted cold through the window. Tomorrow the moon will wane. I've forgotten all other names and pray to the harvest for bounty to come in on snow. I'm told abundance means welcoming all of it. Memory, loss, regret. The snow is bright against my window. Constancy, movement, fracture. The moon will become a sliver and a shadow, then nothing at all, hiding among the stars. Um, this next one is was published in Hunger Mountain. <laughs> you see Aaron <laughs> celebrating there. Um, not very much not a love poem, so we're moving, we're moving on. <laughs> um, and it, it was published under a different name um, in Hunger Mountain at that point. It was called um, History of Fashion 1860 or something like that. Um, and I changed the name since then, but the premise of the poem um, was based, I read this article that talked about um, this is heavy, but how many women died in the year of 1860 because hoop skirts were super flammable. And back then we didn't, you know, there wasn't electricity. So there were oil lamps everywhere and fireplaces and just lots of flames. Um, and it just, I mean, captured my attention and my imagination and my heart. And I wrote a poem about it. So the poem is called Cage Crinoline. Um, and it's estimated that in 1860, 3,000 women burned to death, largely due to the flammability of hoop skirts. Um, crinoline is the material they were made of. It was just very light and flammable. Ballerinas were particularly vulnerable. The tarlatan and gauze, 
but all girls could light like chimney fires, the bells of their hollow hoop skirts funneling air up the legs. In the days of fireplaces and gas stage lamps, don't dance so close. 3,000 women burned that year, catching a hem, tipping a candle. The fabrics were spider webs and angels' gowns. The women dried out Christmas trees, needles dropping. It was before household electricity, but mass-produced fabric meant every girl could leap like Emma Livery, see them at their mirrors, pretending, making small, pouty expressions with eyelashes spread. The slightest misgesture meant death. Ballerina skirts were longer than and light, made to look like seraphs. Everything was white or lavender or buttercup and paid for by old male patrons championing his girl to the top of the playbill. Once a whole row lit in formation, the one on the end too close to the lamp. The others too close to the girl beside her, a new dance began, the same dance when one sister rushed to the fireplace to put the other out. The trouble with hoop skirts was that women could move their legs. They burned down brownstones, apartment buildings, theaters, lost icons, lead dancers, soft faces, those long carved limbs. She was waiting for a casting call, stressed, sneaking a cigarette, had just gotten the tobacco lit when he approached. She'd insisted on warming the house with her husband gone to work and the children away. She needed, she needed the candle to find her bed chambers, brought it right into the room. It cast light on her smile, her bodice, her undone button. She was facing the wall, about to breathe in, turned and tucked the flame behind her back so he wouldn't see. You could almost hear the suck of air pulling inside and up. She brought the candle to her own bedside, after all. Insisted on doing things alone. Had the audacity to dance. Was trying to help her sister. Um, and I should have said that Emma Livery um, was a, a famous ballerina who who died that way. Um, so she was mentioned in the article specifically. We just have a few more. I know we've got a lot of people to hear from tonight. So I've got maybe, I think four more. Bioluminescent. I sink through the water, down to where sand firms underfoot. No wave can move my body. Each wave moves me. All around the beach shines waves and sand up to the rack line. I drift like a whale filtering plankton through baleen, their tiny bodies on my tongue in my blood until my skin flickers blue and green. I am a constellation, stars over a new moon, my body a mirror floating just below the waves. Um, so this book really plays with a few different themes. Um, you know, there's the love poem thread that that I mentioned, <laughs> um, and uh, there's there's quite a few poems about mental health, um, and then there's also quite a few poems about this moment we find ourselves in um, environmentally with so many species kind of collapsing and and going extinct. Um, so this poem is from that that thread of the book. It's called Collapse. Tuna fish. Fresh mahi-mahi, balsamic reduction, scallops wrapped in bacon. The resort had seven swimming pools next to the ocean and no reef-safe sunblock. I swam over the reef wearing banana boat and cringing, flapping my heavy flippers, breathing awkwardly through the mouth, wondering, where are the fish? Where are the fish? I hand over my soggy excuses. The family paid, everyone was going, I'd been so sick. 
all that trash in the headwaters and the two of us filling the tub in our hotel room, turning on the jets. There was a jacuzzi just outside. There was a whole ocean. I could talk about something cute. Those miniature dolphins dying, but it's not just the cute ones. See that man over there with a the sunburn? I could talk about fires or the goats jumping from rock to rock, how they eat everything in sight until soil slides into the sea, how they were brought here on ships. I could talk about ships, how akin they are to airplanes and all that baloney in the in-flight commercial, how flying brings cultures together. Voyeurs and consumers, swordfish on a plate, linguine with lobster sauce. Um, so this next poem is actually part of the title of the book. So the, the title comes from two different poems. Um, one poem is titled Blue and this other one um, is titled Updating the Red List. Um, and the Red List is a website you can go to if you ever feel like being really sad um, that collects kind of data on um, all the species that have gone extinct or are endangered um, in some capacity. And it's used by different um, organizations like the World Wildlife Federation or Foundation um, to pr help them prioritize kind of where to fund different initiatives to, um, for conservation. Um, and I just got to thinking of like, what would it be like to be the, the IT person or the web developer whose job it is to like keep this list updated, right? Keep this piece of infrastructure going. Um, so this is written from that imagined perspective. Updating the red list. Extinct, extinct in the wild, regionally extinct, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened. The red list, a menagerie of unpronounceable Latin, pixelated faces, tree limbs, ferns. I click and drag each picture to its place, count the lost and the losing, guess genus and region by common name before I read the notes. It's easier with my silent game, pretending I can win. I like to open the window while I work, listen to the birds, I tell myself it's not just a funeral, funeral song, no elegy, someone will listen. So I read and type and try not to memorize the names, try not to say them with my full voice, ever a whisper. The bird song grows quieter each morning. At the bottom of each page, a button says, show more. And I'm gonna leave you with this one. Um, it's kind of a quieter piece. And I, I'm, I might've read it for this, uh, this community before. So if you've heard it, I apologize, but it feels like the right note to end on. So it's called A Minute to Seven. A minute to seven and the light comes up misty, rained upon still sounding of crickets. All night I woke on and off to their trill and the fear that I'd rise too late to write, the only practice I know to hold with my small and sufficient God. But I came to on time, and as I finish this pre-dawn seance, the garden emerges out the window. The rain falls barely. My cat listens at the door for the scratch of my slippers, my rousing to feed her. I've sat here for more than an hour and am quietly in love with the morning. Whatever terror is in the world today, may we meet it with a gentle rise. Thanks. Thanks so much for that reading, Lizzie.
Our next reader tonight is Tim Horvath. Tim is the author of Understories, which won the New Hampshire Literary Award for Outstanding Work of Fiction. His book, Circulation, uh, is, is another one of his published books. And in collaboration with composer and cellist Raffaele Andrade, he um, has worked on the project Unbow. Tim's stories have appeared or are forthcoming in journals such as Conjunctions, Agni, Hayden's Fairy Review, and elsewhere. Tim is also a current visiting faculty member for the MFA in Writing and Publishing program. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Lizzie, those, po those poems were just gorgeous and so powerful. I'm, I'm glad to have the sound still in my head of them. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be reading, I'm going to read uh, what, uh, one full piece from uh, Unbow, the collaboration um, that I've been working on. And, um, and then just the, the very beginning of another piece uh, from that same collaboration. I thought what I would do is just play you a very brief um, clip. That, so the, each, uh, each story is based on a bow stroke or a musical style. Um, so in this case, the first piece I'm going to read is called um, Bio, and that is a, a musical rhythm that comes from northeastern Brazil. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you, I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to play you, um, whoops. Uh, so this is what that rhythm sounds like, just so you can... So, so now that that's in your head, um, I also wanted to briefly just give you a, a tiny taste of Raphael's interpretation of that, which is rather different from the traditional sound. So, and all of this is, um, is performed by her on a, uh, an instrument that she designed and built herself from scratch, um, uh, and uh, um, which she calls canural. It's an electroacoustic cello. Um, so, um, so that's a little bit of the backdrop, the context. Um, so this is my story, um, Bio, which, uh, came from that collaboration. And this actually is also appearing in, in Hunger Mountain um, in the forthcoming issue. Sam has always had a knack for facts. He likes answers to questions such as, if you were to sharpen a pencil and scoop together all the shavings, how much space would they take up? He attempted this in class. They were supposed to estimate. And I got a call from the principal and Sam insisting it was okay. He'd take the punishment, but he just needed to measure. Brazil has loomed as his latest obsession since Lechia and her family moved in down the street. From the moment he found out they were from there, it's been Brazil this, Brazil that. Did we know it was the fifth largest country in the world and that it took up most of South America? And the Amazon rainforest was the most biodiverse place in the whole entire world. And that included the brown-throated sloth and the bald wakari and the blue poison dart frog and, and, and. That's amazing, I say. And I'm glad that he knows so much already. Although sometimes, as with Mark, when he's explaining some detail of engineering, it can feel as though I'm being crushed by information. I want them to both be wrong sometimes, justified to myself on the basis of it being an important life lesson to own mistakes, wear blemishes, but probably I'm just being petty. She sounds really cool. She is, he says, and adds that Brazil is also the coolest place. Although that's part of the problem that the rainforest is being decimated. And if that happens, he says, cradling the air as if holding an inflatable globe, the earth is doomed but also he wants to know what is interesting about us. 
He wants to know because Lechia has been to Brazil and has all sorts of interesting tales to tell and plays the accordion and he has only been to Coral Gables and it is not the same and mostly he plays video games. Something interesting that happened to us, once we followed someone with the wrong umbrella for five blocks thinking it was grandpa when they'd already gone inside a store. Oh, my aunt Mona was an extra in lots of movies. We've probably seen her in something and didn't even know it. I'm not sure this is true, whether she's been in anything kid friendly enough that Sam would have seen it. And I'm pretty sure it isn't. And also her acting career never took off, but it's what I can think of for now. We do a play date at the playground and I get to meet Lechia's grandmother, her Ava, who takes care of her while Lechia's mother is, is on one of her nursing shifts, sometimes on weekends. I should say that in uh, Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese, avó is grandmother and avó is grandfather, as they show up in the story. We watch the kids run around. It's one of those intricate wooden playgrounds with lots of hidden corners and tire swings and spider web chains and boat steering wheels and dangling plank bridges. I say so much to do with a sweeping gesture and she nods and smiles and says something in what must be Portuguese. We sit on the bench and watch the kids and I wish that I could have a conversation with her. Though her skin sags and her hair is graying, I can see the clear lineage between her and Lechia. I catch a fierce determination in Lechia's eyes when she's clambering up the side of a castle, not bothering with the ladder. And again, when I see her defending Sam when some older kids are taunting him. And her Ava has those eyes, even just taking it all in from the bench. At the end of the day, Sam says, how can we find out where the wood came, came from? The wood, I ask? Yes, he says, because if it came from the rainforest, then I don't want to play there again. He starts going back and forth to her house and she becomes a regular in our place. Soon he's a fan of churrasco and chimichurri sauce while Lechia asks for second helpings of lasagna. Lechia is going to teach him how to play the accordion. One day Mark shows them how to use Google Earth Street View to show you footage of anywhere in the world. And Lechia tries to find where both her avo and her ava came from. One a city, one more rural. The more rural one doesn't show up, but she says, that's what it looks like there when they get close on the map, a scraggy, scruffy desert rust. One day he comes home and says, Lechia's Ava had radiation. Is that so? Like the X-Men, she got a dose of radiation. Lechia told me all about it. Could that mean she has mutant powers? From this, I discern that Lechia's grandmother must be receiving some form of cancer treatment. I think it is marvelous the way kids process things, how they weave a story that makes so much that is incomprehensible make sense. Sometimes Sam will give me intricate backstories about characters like Cyclops and Wolverine that I can't possibly keep track of. And I know that he identifies with them, their outsiderdom. It doesn't mean that I say, it, it means she's probably sick and is getting treatment. No, he says, she got her radiation a long time ago from cesium-137 in Goiania. This is concerning enough that after Sam goes to bed, I call Lechia's mother, and this is how I learn about the Goiania incident. Her mother is not surprised that I haven't heard of it. Most people in the US haven't, though it was one of the world's biggest nuclear accidents. Her mother, the Ava I sat beside at the playground, was living in the city at the time. It is what inspired her to leave. Lechia's mother tells me, she tested negative, but had had enough. She moved to Rio, met my father, the accordion player. And now she went on, here we are. Well, not him. He passed away a few years ago. Before we hang up, she tells me, I'm so glad that Lechia has such a loyal friend. She always talks about Sam. She calls him Irmeo Meis Novo, her little brother. Curious myself, I go online to learn more. What I read is a tragic story about an abandoned medical facility 
where radioactive equipment was left behind unprotected, about unsuspecting interlopers who took parts to sell, not knowing that they were trailing radiation. It spread through the town rapidly and invisibly, undetected till people started getting sick. 249 people, so close to a round number as if something, God, nature, fate, had spared a single person. The most wrenching detail of all is that of a man who brought home some blue specks, no bigger than grains of rice to his family and handed one to his daughter. It crumbled into powder and she must have dabbed it on her cheeks as any girl would, as they would have at Carnival. Some alighted on her stomach. The sandwich is the thing that stabs me, though no doubt she would have gotten sick and died anyway. It was far too much for her body. I think about Leccia and the way she bounded across the planks of wood and hoisted herself up the playground, how she kept one eye on Sam whenever they were together. I think of her Aval, who had walked away from her appointment in Goiania, what it would have taken to leave the city where she was born. Maybe she was that 250th person, I think. But surely everyone who survived thought, knew secretly that they were that person. When we go into lockdown, Sam misses being at school and Mr. Cabela, but he misses Lecce and her family most of all. It's hard for him to understand. I don't want him to spend all his time online, but that's the way it works out at first between video games and Google. Earth, where Sam travels all over Brazil. Brasilia, boring, he says. Curitiba, he loves the Oscar Niemeyer Museum, like a spaceship or a chunk of the sky that is broken away and landed on the ground and so on. He finds a video game in which the goal is to protect the rainforest by saving species and planting trees. He and Leccia play for hours, but it isn't the same. Mark is working from home, and he and I are constantly stepping on one another's toes. His Zoom calls require him to be loud, or rather his job requires it. And when he puts on headphones, he just gets louder. His snoring has somehow gotten more grating. Are we going to be one of those quarantine splits that people are already speculating or will inevitably happen? Meanwhile, Sam wants to know when he and Leccia can have another play date. I tell him we don't know, that we can't go to the playground again, not for the time being, not until the virus is contained. I don't tell him that Leccia's mother has to stay elsewhere for the time being, away from her family, but Leccia tells him. I think about how strange this must be for Sam, they're so close that they can almost call out to him. One night, I think I smell Tarasco from the direction of their apartment, but then the wind shifts and I think I must have imagined it. One evening after dinner, they're FaceTiming each other and I hear the accordion. It's a wonder to watch even on the screen, this girl in her apartment dimly lit with the light catching off it, the instrument which seems as wide as she is tall, and she seems lost in it, one hand dancing on the keys, the other skipping back and forth across the buttons like a hopscotch quilt. The rhythm is off kilter, gleeful, irresistible. Come dance, mama, says Sam, and while I have not danced in many years, I take his hands. We are both laughing and I realize how rare his smile has been in these weeks. He turns up the volume and a rich, mellifluous sound spills out, filling our apartment. It brings Mark out of his office and he says, what's going on here? And Sam offers him a hand, which to my amazement, he takes. And this is how our Friday night ritual begins. She plays the tunes her grandfather taught her. It is bio, Sam explains to me, and it comes from Pernambuco, a region in the Northeast, and he tries tapping out the rhythm on the table, but keeps getting it wrong. I reassure him, and Lechia does too. I'm still learning, and this seems to put him at ease. Lechia plays while her avo sings and Mark, Sam, and I dance. They show us some moves. Her grandmother is shockingly, impossibly live. At some point, someone suggests that we put on the mask that we now 
need to wear to go to the store anywhere, really. Abba says something and Letia translates. She says it's like carnival. And for a few hours every day, it does not seem like we are trapped inside. Letia is a wonder to watch, her squeezing with all her might. At one point, her Ava's voice cracks a little and she stops singing. Sam rushes to the screen as though he could break through it into her room, traverse any distance in an instant. What is it, Sam asks? Is she hurt? Then we hear Letia talking to her Avo, and through her tears, her, her Avo says something in Portuguese, and Letia tells us. This song reminds her of when she first met my Avo. She had just arrived in Rio, and he was playing on the corner. He had a hat out for coins. She pauses, then more of the story. He looked just like a country, Letia pauses here, searching, like kind of what you would call a bumpkin. She smiles, says something to her ava that makes her smile and nod. He asked her if she sang, and she asked what songs he knew. And he said, you sing them and I'll play them, the ones I know and the ones I don't, the old songs and the new. When Letia resumes, I catch again that glint in her eyes, the same as when she was pulling her way up the sheer vertical of the playground, ladderless. Another siren goes by beneath our window. The accordion in her grip looks like a giant, powerful set of lungs. And I imagine that with every contraction, every release, she is giving air to us, the entire city, wherever it is needed, the old songs and the new. So that is uh, one of the stories. And then I thought I would just read um, a tiny bit of uh, another one, just to give you a taste of the range. Um, so this one I feel like is in a very different style. It's called the Tungsten Wrecker. And um, this one is on in the journal Conjunctions Online if you wanted to read um, the rest of it, because um, I'll just have time for the beginning. What wasn't ours? Send more Chuck Berry, went the joke. How the aliens would reply when they got their first spin of the golden record on the Voyager. Sweet, friendly aliens with toe-tapping rhythm, whether or not they had feet. An appreciation for sweat and guitar riffs pooling together, even if they had no first-hand experience with either. They would ignore Box, Brandenburg, and the Javanese court gamelan, the come on now, it's okay, of a mother's voice, the gloppy birth of mud pots, the map that showed them our neighborhood, gave them directions to find us in space, the silhouette family in all their kilogrammatic dimensions, embryo with proud jutting umbilicus, the images of stopped cars and tuk-tuks that made it seem that earthlings sat mired in traffic everywhere on earth all the time. None of that, none of that just more Johnny be good. But that wasn't our joke, and we had no shortage of them. We had jokes upon jokes piled up through the years as if to decree that our relationship wasn't one, and that the best way to ensure that was to construct an inviolable geodesic dome of jest around it. Not only did we have jokes, but we had whole languages. If anything, languages were what we had most of all. I specialized in them was a programmer who bounced around Silicon Valley till I got stuck in one stringifying brackety loop too many, hooked on modafinil, sick of the bravado that we were going to engineer our way into ethical wealth. I'd been one of those nerdy teenagers who leapt at the chance to farm out my computer to SETI, and I allowed it to revert to the screensaver, a flickering spiky field, green to fuchsia, marching again and again across my monitor. I was crunching data from satellite dishes and telescopes, and I was hooked on the idea of panning for life in my corner of the universe. This I told you in our first conversation. What are the odds against any meeting? On the dessert line at the 2008 International Conference on the Search for Extraterrestrial Life in the Universe, Ixelu, in Jacksonville, 
a delay as the frazzled caterers fetched more actual ice cream for the ice cream bar they'd set up, and we struck up small talk over our empty bowls. I held mine up like a satellite dish, joked that my SETI screensaver had been keeping NASA's refrigerators cooled, and you shot back that astronaut ice cream, that dry, crumbly stuff didn't need refrigeration, that that was in fact its only redeeming quality. And already I could see your mind, how it would slice any topic. In the keynote we just heard, otherwise lackluster, the speaker had made the Chuck Berry joke. And so one of us said something like, maybe it's Chuck Berry ice cream they want after all. And the other said, what would that consist of? And we entered into one, one of those zones where a separate universe is created between two people, even in the middle of a crowded room, a line of scientists from around the world, overstuffed with chicken cordon bleu and slivered almonds, now staring at toppings with nothing to put them on. And I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tim. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our next reader of the evening. Um, Xin Yi Pai is a poet, essayist, and visual artist. She's the author of several books of poetry, including Enzo, Citing Selected Works, Ozark, Adamantine, and Equivalents. She served as the fourth poet laureate of the city of Redmond from 2015 to 2017, and has been an artist in residence for the Seattle Art Museum, Town Hall Seattle, and Pacific Science Center. She serves as assistant director in our MFA in writing and publishing program here at VCFA, and she's also a faculty member for the Tuolatine Valley Creates Arts Incubator. So please help me in welcoming Shinyi Pai. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, friends, for being here tonight. Uh, I'm going to read primarily from my book, Enzo, which came out um, in March 2020 uh, during the pandemic. And then I'll finish up towards the end with a couple of poem films that I've produced in the last couple of years. Um, so I'm going to read from you from um, read to you from a section of the book that uh, is a set of poems that were inspired by contemporary art and visual artists. And we'll talk a little bit about each of who those artists are. Um, the first couple of poems I'll read are inspired by a German sculptor and installation artist named Wolfgang Leib. Um, he's a very unusual artist in that um, he makes his sculptures out of uh, natural and organic materials exclusively. So materials like beeswax, flower pollen, milk, rice, stone, and um, they're very unusual to encounter in gallery settings. Uh, in the summer months when different flowers and bushes come into bloom around his home in rural Germany, he will actually go around these plants and hand harvest the pollen off of the plants, sift it, collect it, and use it to create these really beautiful, like uh, ephemeral floor pieces, like gallery installations that are like Mark Rothko paintings, or um, in the case of my poem, um, he made a a uh, sculpture that he called the Five Mountains Do Not Climb On, which were a series of three inch pollen mountains that are typically shown behind like a plexiglass wall. Um, the second poem that I'll read about his work is a piece about um, his sculpture called the Milkstone. And just to describe the Milkstone to you briefly, it is a slab of white Italian marble, which the artist Wolfgang Leib has then basically carved a groove or a lip around the perimeter of the top of the stone. So there's kind of like a, a reservoir there. And then what he does is he pours milk, uh, this fluid into the reservoir and has, uh, this sculpture kind of is in a strange sort of suspended state of being both solid and liquid and you know, catches the dust and you know, the vibration of people walking by. It's just a very unusual piece. So this is poem for Wolfgang Leib. A life of collecting pollen from hazelnut bushes, a life of gathering word grains to find all you have wanted, all you have waited to say. Five mountains we cannot climb, hills we cannot touch. Perhaps we are only here to say house, bridge, or gate. The passage to somewhere else, yellow molecules spooned and sifted from a jar filled with sunlight pouring milk over stone. You are the energy that breaks form, building wax houses pressed from combs, a wax room set upon a mountain, an offering of rice, nowhere, everywhere, the songs of shams. 
Milkstone. The splash and spread of milk poured over stone like paint applied to wet watercolor paper. The slow bleed to edge, milk on Macedonian marble, tension of liquid on solid surface, purer than pigment laid over unprimed canvas by Robert Ryman. Caked with paint, white on white, a circle of milk poured and pulled into a square. Finger drawn, milk mandala, to flood the gates, turn a finger inwards. Throwing a glance, the Buddha lifted a finger in a crowd of thousands. Gesture overflowing fullness, liquid trails gliding into seamless trembling being. So this next piece is about a painter uh, who lives and works in Dallas. His name is John Komara. And he's very much um, influenced by the abstract expressionist painters like Jackson Pollock, who had their canvases on the floor and would walk around them pouring and hurling paint. Uh, Pumara is kind of pushing that technique a step further in that um, he's also working with those materials, um, aluminum uh, sorts of surfaces that he pours his uh, paint onto. But he actually became very interested in um, the newspapers around his canvases that were collecting the paint drippings that would fall off of them. So what he did is he took those paint drippings and he took them to like a Xerox machine and he scanned them, he blew them up, he enlarged them, he output them, and then he scanned them back into a computer. And he then used those images as basically the basis of creating a study or series of paintings. This piece is called Feedback after John Pumara. The push and pull of paint sliding across a surface, rolling tremolo machine paint flows off the hard edge of aluminum. Rorschach drips red on the horizontal, a graph of the body's progress. Stuttering on the vertical, a screenplay, glitches on eight millimeter, race across a film strip, shifting, cut up, Xerox, magnified, blow up, Dragged across an electric eye, emanations of light from behind the screen, the absence of painter, presence of machine. The television, a template for a sketch enacted in childhood, boxes full of light reaching through the screen, the human hand leaves its traces. Uh, this poem is uh, inspired by the work of Piet Mondrian, painter de style. Blocks of color move across canvas, syncopated revisionist divisionism, a method of placing blue alongside yellow to signify green. Surratt's influence in Mondrian's early work, the windmill at Blaricum, Dutch landscape painting, and years spent rendering chrysanthemums, collecting images from nature, a subsequent progression from reality to abstraction, rectangular planes and the repetition of elements. Red, Blue, white, yellow, black, lines drawn, crossed out and drawn again, lines drawn, crossed out and drawn again, to add more boogie-woogie, dissonant harmony, measures of blue on the downbeat. And just give me a second, I've got to admit somebody in the waiting room. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna read a couple of poems um, inspired by the work of James Terrell who is a California light artist. And um, he's very well known for making these things called Gonsfelds. Um, he creates these architectural spaces uh, that have cutouts in the ceilings. So uh, a visitor will enter the space. They, they have one at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. There's one at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, but also there in New York and on the East Coast as well. So you enter these spaces and you kind of sit and you watch this portal over you. and you know, the changing patterns of the sky and uh, darkness falling, and they kind of play with your uh, perception of light in interesting ways. So um, every time I go to a city that has a James Terrell piece, I go to the Terrell piece and I write something. So um, this is from um, three, three different pieces that I've visited over the years. Tending Blue. And this one is about uh, the, the sky space in Dallas that actually got closed. Tending blue, contemplating urban building feet, two art fanatics launch a scarlet red sphere skywards at the exact location of the future museum tower, an empty concrete lot to test a theory of infringement upon an artist's field of vision. Three years later, the glass skin of a neighboring luxury condo project scorches the natural lawn with too much reflected light, the frames, edges, scaffolding, construction hoists. 
light rain. Inside the sky viewing chamber, galaxy black granite flecked flooring reverses a cutout of azure light in the late winter. Each echoing nightfall, stone mirror map of, of infinite constellation. And this one's inspired by the sky space in uh, Pomona, Star Shrine. Altar, altar, alma, mater, matter, mutter, moonward, murmur, muster, muscle, muse, mute. This piece is called Poem for Art Handlers and is inspired from uh, my days of working in uh, visual art museums and just my love and affection for visual artists. Poem for Art Handlers. Start from square one, 21 isometric cubes of varying sizes with color ink washes, superimposed guidelines for a wall drawing, a written instruction in tangible scribbled notes and diagrams. Find creative storage solutions, 3,000 pounds of Belgian candies imported for a Gonzalez Torres exhibition to be stored on the delivery dock or held in low humidity alongside Canaletto. If only we hadn't sprayed the crickets raining from the ceilings clogging the elevator shafts, one step up on the evolutionary food chain above wingless insects feeding on the pollen fields, engorged bugs leaving their tracks Wire a phone jack in the East Gallery and wait for Yoko Ono to call. She will telephone and tell you to imagine a happening where you clock out early after letting loose at closing a herd of starving cats converging to lap up milk pooling on the marble stone. And um, this last um, poem inspired by the visual arts that I'll read is for my mother, Noko. Um, it is inspired by a painting uh, by the Zen monk Mu Chi of uh, a piece called Six Persimmons. Uh, six Persimmons is an, is an ink painting with um, an image of six persimmons that um, art historians and religious scholars have interpreted as representing the six different stages of enlightenment. So this is Six Persimmons for my mom, Noko. After ruining another season's harvest overbaked in the kitchen oven, then rehydrated in her home sauna, Aunt Yuki calls upon her sister. Paper sacks stuffed full of orange fruit, twig and stalk still intact, knows that my mother sprouts seedlings from cast off avocado stones, revives dead succulents, coaxes blooms out of, orchard, out of orchids, a woman, who has never spent a second of her being on the world wide web, passes her days painting the diversity of marshland, woodland, and shoreline, building her own dehydrator fashioned from my father's work ladders, joined together by discarded swimming pool, perched high to discourage the neighbor's cats that invade the yard, scavenging for koi. Vitamin D, she says, as she harnesses the sun. In the backyard, the drying device mutates into painting, Slow drip sugar spilled out of one khaki fruit, empty space where my father untethers another persimmon he swallows whole. So um, this last poem that I'll read to you before showing you a couple of films is a piece about uh, the cabaret uh, singer Pat Suzuki. So a, um, a historic theater here in Seattle approached me and asked me if I would write a piece about uh, the neighborhood of Belltown where this particular theater exists. And they gave me like a huge dossier of information, like hundreds of pages about like the history of Belltown and interesting quirky characters who live there. And I went through all this information and um, was captivated by the story of one particular individual, Pat Suzuki, this Japanese American torch singer who um, had come through Seattle um, when she was touring for a theatrical production, ended up staying. And um, you know, her story was really um, meaningful to me in that she was an Asian American who went on to like star on Broadway and leave it because it wasn't what she wanted. And um, she had grown up um, and spent three years living in the Japanese internment camps. And, Today is the anniversary of the Day of Remembrance when uh, President Roosevelt signed uh, Executive Order 9066, which 
authorized the American army to basically uh, remove and incarcerate hundreds of thousands of Japanese American citizens. So um, just wanted to share this piece today, Chibi. And Chibi is a childhood name for Pat Suzuki, which uh, she was the youngest of four children. So that roughly translates as um, the name Squirt. In the vintage footage, Old Blue Eyes calls her Patricia, insisting you can't get anywhere as a singer unless you're Italian. But Frank, I'm Japanese, she protested. I'm from Seattle. At the age of 11, little Chiyoko, the all-American girl, sent packing to the High Plains, locked up at Granada War Relocation Center for the crime of being descended from the Japanese. How does suffering shape a life? Behind barbed wire, imprisoned children grew up to be poet, printmaker, nightclub singer. Lawson Inada, Arthur Okamura, Pat Suzuki the record reaching back so far we strain to hear the past. In place of cooking or setting the table, kids play house standing in imaginary mess hall lines. Floating over barbed wire, the jade rabbit pounds mochi in the full moon. Six guard towers armed with machine guns here for our own safety. The silk vest handmade for a boy's deployment, 1,000 red knots, each hand tied by a different detainee. Thin-walled tar paper barracks can't block the biting chill of winter. Before raising the camp, the last act building a marker for the dead. As Suzuki, she arrived in Seattle. Her ex-husband Norm described how she sashayed off the street, decamping from a bit part at the moor, where she was cast as a minor oriental in tea house of the August moon. 100 pounds of Nisei dynamite with a voice that could loosen the tiles on Broadway's towers. Three years later, in the role of Linda Lowe, the stripper in the flower drum song, her signature tune, I love being a girl. We question why a rising star might quit a bright career in New York theater. Preferring podunk clubs or motherhood over art, she embraced the person that she always was to find herself at home in a cabaret of her own making that place where she saw herself reflected in the pale white faces of the public, where she shattered stereotype, inhabiting her skin, flush with more than anyone from Camp Amachi could ever dream. And I'm gonna show you what amounts to roughly about four minutes of uh, video. So um, let me share screen. Okay, and I'm going to show you, are you looking at a screen uh, that is black um, and there's nothing on it? Is that what you see? Can somebody turn on their audio and tell me what you see? I see your files. Okay, so let's, let me stop that sharing and try again because this is sometimes quirky. Okay, here's my quick time, Claire. Okay, um, Eli, do you see a black screen? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, <laughs> so um, this piece is called Tidal. It's with my collaborator, David Ian Bickley, who is a filmmaker in the UK. And it's one part of a five-part poem about uh, Buddhist reincarnation and notions of karma um, as, as um, investigated through the metaphor of looking at tides. And this is um, Tidal. <laughs> The ocean bulges towards the moon as wine decanted in a chalice flows over a rim. The coastal edge, a liquid boundary, the planet's flood tides guided by celestial mechanics. In the moon, the rise and fall of tidal surf. Lunar phases pull gravitational forces, bring incoming storm surges, orbital cycles of shutting. Tsunami swells like scorched earth, wash away corporeal traces of calcium, sodium, phosphate, copper, and chloride trappings. Mineral and matter discharged.
Okay, let me queue up the other one. Um, give me one second. That one's still playing. Hold on a second. Oi. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see here. Share screen. And um, hold on one second. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I think this should work. Let's see. Okay, share screen. Here we go. So this next piece is um, a piece called Embarkation, and it is about visiting um, a traditional folk festival on the western coast of Taiwan called the Wang Ye Boat Burning Festival. And um, it's basically a piece that is about um, observing a cultural festival where a community um, cleanses itself of kind of unfulfilled wishes, uh, broken dreams, and the illnesses that plague it during a period of time. And they end up um, incinerating these um, metaphors and burning them off. And so it's part of a large spectacle um, that involves the burning of a life-size boat that I got to observe in 2018. And uh, here's the piece. Can you all see it? Um, it's starting now. Is it playing for you guys? Yes. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Butter lamp, incense stick, bees wax votive, the occasion of poem. Rites I enact to set the world aglow with the light of desire, the fire of mind. Adorned in the colors of the eight temples, the caretakers of the Wang Ye gods march through the streets of the seaside town. The lone envoy bearing a square yoke parades the wooden boat through narrow lanes until nightfall, when the barge is brought to rest upon a bed of joss paper. Earlier that night, Men load the boat with handwritten wishes. The misfortunes and plague of my past year to be piloted up to the heavens in a blast of fireworks that deafens the crowd that came to bear witness to ceremony. We observe as each of us does Some of us bail out before a thing is done to escape our ghosts. We watch it burn. I can't unsnarl the knot of unmet want, so I sever it in heat. Draw the cord into flame to free myself from the clutch of haunting. To disembark at the latitude of where I give up the ship. Thanks so much, all. That was a piece with Scott Kiva James. All right, we have one more presenter tonight. Pradita Sharma is the author of the poetry collections, Grief Sequence, Undergloom, Infamous Landscapes, The Opening Question and Bliss to Fill. She is the founder of the conference, Thinking Its Presence, Race, Creative Writing, Literary Studies and Art. Recipient of the 2010 Howard Foundation Award Brigida has taught at the University of Montana and now teaches at Pomona College. Welcome, Brigida. Thank you, Shinyi. It was one, it's wonderful to read with you. Thank you, Rita. And thank you to the wonderful poets, um, Shinyi, Lizzie, and Tim, and writer, and, and Tim, and sorry, now I'm butchering everything, and Lizzie, the, for the wonderful prose and poetry. Um, it's great to be here, and I, I wish I could visit Vermont because I love Vermont. and. 
I'm an East Coaster who's transplanted to the West <laughs> the last, I guess now, 15 years. Um, I'm gonna read uh, uh, from my, my book, Grief Sequence, and then a few new poems. Uh, this, this book is kind of a downer. <laughs> um, I guess grief really can kind of alert you to that. Um, it's about, it's about um, losing my, um, my, my late husband to esophageal cancer. Um, he was diagnosed in November of 2014 and he died in January of 2015. So it was two months from uh, diagnosis to death. Um, and I was reading Roland Barthes morning diary and it really helped me frame some of these poems. Um, my late husband was quite a difficult, he had a difficult personality. So these poems do hold a lot of complicated feelings. Um, obviously I loved him dearly, um, but I also just struggled with some of his, his demons. I just wanted to prepare you that because people sort of have an expectation of poems in a certain way and then these unload a little. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll just, I'm gonna read the first seven poems from this, um, from this book. Um, also, I just wanna say he, he, when he died, he fell unconscious. So I wasn't prepared for him to die. Um, he had a secondary tumor, a brain tumor that just happened, which is what they say with esophageal cancer, that the secondary tumor ends up um, being the kind of, um, th that, that, that can surprise you. So I'm just gonna read a few lines from Bard, Morning Diary, that helped me frame this book. Not to suppress mourning, suffering, the stupid notion that time will do away with such a thing, but to change it, transform it, to shift it from a static stage, stasis, obstruction, recurrences of the same thing to a fluid state. I'm gonna start with a poem um, after the uh, poet Alice Notley who lost two partners. Uh, so her, her poems really guided me too. On seclusion and looking out. Seclusion may kill your heart in the process of producing the love-stained stench in your poems, the ones containing boundaries of shame with their sober problems, bits describing loss, mirroring its inward entanglements, glow torches you have never seen before. You light them with two selves and don't wait for anything to flicker false. You can discern the lantern of a falling man who burned down his desire with tiny humiliated gestures. The mountain peak so high, thus you believe it gives you the one majestic evening you earned. Its embrace is a gentle coercion into wide wilderness, an amenable tyranny of its expansion. Grief's artillery to fill all of the black clouds that sallow blue sky, painting it with electric photographic sweeps. You have to find your strength in this. This is a poem in two parts. Complicated spiritual grief, part one. It was violent and it wasn't. It was violent because it was the kind of cancer to which people refer as beastly, as pure evil. And though I do not really believe in a Christian God or devil, I was left facing one. I'm a non-believer. When I faced it, all I had was his past before the cancer and what was leading up to it, which led me down his rabbit hole, which may have included a brain tumor and many other tumors. All the spindly parts, tumor shaped, even things painted to me by his admirers, some faulty, some careless, spindly grievers. I couldn't look at any of them as they kept metastasizing, but that was an action I knew was not mine to claim, but through my affections for my beloved. How could I not love some of his friends or students? How is it that I settle on these feelings as he disappears? Um, and just to set up the second poem, um, uh, Dale and I both taught at the University of Montana. He taught in the sound uh, department and he, um, he and I would co-teach sometimes and um, we were co-teaching my class that was on, which I probably will never teach this class again. It, it's on Polanski and Cassavetes, um, two really complicated filmmakers. Um, 
but anyway, I'm, I'm referring to husbands. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen Cassavetti's husbands, but um, it kind of takes over this poem. Complicated spiritual grief, part one. Because I am the kind of non-believer who believed in the culture around me, I was watching for fragments to arise out of our habits, such as watching madmen or thinking about madmen, as Dale always said, men who are always falling from buildings out of fear, anguish, alcoholism, a particular self-destruction from self-annihilation, pinhole pains. Like in Cassavetti's husbands, there were these men, I found his notes for teaching that film, and at first I thought it was his personal confession, but it wasn't. It was a list of teaching notes, infidelity, vomiting, being a father, being a husband. I thought about his sonic piece titled, Sorry About the Rage. I was sorry about it too. So what now? I grieve. I lust for company that I can't ask for. I turn into my own madman. Can I do this? Did he enter my body, his energy? Can I be him lusting for himself? Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, well, one part of early grieving, I think that we all do is we find something kind of mundane that's joyful or we try to. I found Pandora's 70s light, <laughs> and I thought that every 70s song was like the dead speaking to the living. I'm thinking of David Gates, and um, uh, I just just listening to Stevie Wonder, and um, uh, I'm forgetting his name. I can't believe I'm forgetting his name, but the um, the, the guy who sings "Sentimental Lady" um, from Fleetwood Mac, who is not with us anymore, Bob Bob Welch. Um, so I, I loved Sentimental Lady and listened to it a lot. Um, so this is 70, 70s light and 14 joys and 14 furies. All my life I waited to sing holler in the bathtub to my own pure dewdrop fury, but it only came with your death and my aching to live out the adequacy of a 70s narrative all the way to its heart probe peak and loss. I was a margin cord rammed with storytelling and with susceptible palpitation to sentimentality in search of a piston. I was sounding out each coarse tangled lyric, unladylike, but finding comfort in its theme. You know, I also can't help but think of um, the late C.D. Wright, who is my professor and friend, and I think about her lyric, and I also think about the title of her selected, Steal Away. And I listened to a lot of 70s after she passed. I'm going to jump into these sequences um, in the kind of middle of this book. And this is a one about Dale's death. I mean, there's a lot of his de death in here, but. Um, Sequence seven, I thought he was over medicating himself and planning his suicide. I took the pills away from him. He looked defeated. He said as much. I felt sorry for both of us. His expressions held this enormity and a seared exhausted center. Spatial discomfort started to affect him but didn't take hold till the next day when he started to lose consciousness and rattled the house yelling about thieves, robbers, drunks and pill snatchers. We didn't know what was going on. The tumor was rapidly metastasizing its mass through his cerebellum. His body became harder to manage and he sprang fearfully through the house, tugging violently at his bile duct tube. Asia and I camped in the front rooms. The last night of intimacy, of lucidity unbeknownst to me, we sat together huddled and I caressed him, cradling his arms, his leg and his, pe his legs and his penis. I was sure we had time left for more, but this was the last time he spoke and searched my face and looked at me with a recognition I understood. It's how we moved out of consciousness and I'm haunted by those last days before we succumbed to hospice. I remember how stunning he was resting in bed that week before 
in our library with a cornflower blue sheeted bed prepared lovingly by Ashby and Spider. In that bed, an official hospice, he had a look of wonder when we put movies on. He excited over Wilson, the ball and cast away and stared unblinkingly at Tom Hanks. We giggled over this and appreciated how Andrew put the Eno station on next and Asia lit and framed the sheeted bed with twinkling lamp and illuminant bulbs Dale found soothing. We all watched him compose in the air to fill up glass. I wished that we could have unleashed him to his afterlife then. That would have been what he wanted. That's what he would have wanted. A release to his own universe, sonant and material, an ethereal ball, an awkward Tom Hanks, a Wilson and a castaway in a glittering hand-printed sea. This death sequence was the one I wanted for him. Um, instead, Dale um, took seven days um, to die, and it was it was really excruciating to watch. Um, I did um, after um, after like a long while. I, um, I I met somebody, a widower, um, who was an acquaintance of ours. And um, he really helped me through the process. Um, and something he taught me was that, you know, you, you kind of love two people when you fall in love again. Um, and so I wanted to kind of think about that and write about it. I look at your handwriting. I look at your handwriting and it pushes space into its narrow field. His were big atmospheric box crosses with architecture. Your speech and talk are the opposite. You have soft catalectic vowels. His were hard chains of dream speak. How is this possible? What is richly characterized by handwriting? What is its dictionary of attributes? Where is there an airy space between the way he and I loved? Because then and suddenly I loved again. And it arose against sequential time. This makes loving two persons its own counsel. One followed the other, but there is still yet simultaneity. The other loved me, but had trouble loving, and I had to absorb this after death. There is loving without knowing and loving with so much knowing. Two bodies separate in the night after the coupling of evening time. One goes up to his room and slowly dies, cigarette after cigarette. After his feeding tube and bile duct were inserted, he wouldn't sleep in our bed. The two broad categories of sequence learning exist, explicit and implicit with subcategories, which also become dreaming and reading the handwriting. You were the first person and now you are one person and there is a second person. Explicit sequence learning has been known and studied since the discovery of sequence learning. However, recently implicit sequence learning has gained more attention and research. A form of implicit learning may be implicit dreaming, maybe a contrary dreaming occurs. Maybe dying is more implicit in its sequence. Maybe learning refers to the underlying methods of dreaming or airy spaces or writing words to both beloveds that contrary people are unaware of what's explicit and what's implicit. In other words, learning without knowing is dreaming. So I think I'm just gonna read um, three, three more poems. Um, and these are uh, poems from my new manuscript. Um, and this new manuscript, um, it's, it started, um, I started while uh, my partner Mike and I were traveling um, when we all could travel. <laughs> um, I, I started to, we were looking at modern art and I started to find these Barnett Newman paintings in different collections. And I just um, found, I was just really centering myself around the centered zip or line in his his pieces. And I started to think about them. And the title of the series is, it's the One Mint series. And so it's one, M-E-N-T, One Mint. And then he has the number one. Um, but I um, loved that series title so much. Um, this new manuscript is titled One Mint, and then it's W-O-N, One Mint One. So it's a book trying to kind of think about um, healing. Uh, it's also thinking about conflict too, and secondary traumas and conflict and friendships. 
and everything else now that the pandemic happened. Um, and I, I'm writing a little, I'm writing also something I learned um, through this grief is you can, you know, after the spouse dies, you can lose the blended family. And lots of widows and widowers would tell me how their life just changed. And mine did too. And so I wanted to start writing about um, how, you know, uh, how you kind of these secondary heartbreaks happen and you have to kind of piece them together. And uh, so I, I was also teaching, um, I was just sorry, this is a long winded thing. I was teaching the um, a Katha Upanishad uh, to my uh, poetry students um, at University of Montana before I came to Pomona. And we were kind of developing a prosody project from the Upanishads, which then made me start rereading them. And my, my dad's a priest, so he and I have been talking about them. And so I'm, I lift an, uh, a line from the Upanishads in this in one of my poems and in my book, I'm hoping to, to make more with it. Um, so anyway, that was a long winded intro to these last three poems. But this one I couldn't help writing from the pandemic. So I know, I don't know what it's like in Vermont, but in New York, people would call their therapists therapists, but in Montana, they call them counselors. And so I just, I, no offense to anyone who uses the term counselor, I respect I respect both terms, I'm just having fun. Therapist versus counselor. I prefer therapist because the term counselor suggests the patient is not a patient, but a passerby in need of menial advice. Did you grow up by the sea or close to its New England windows? Did, you let your psych did your psyche let in the tranquility of being near the sea? I pretend I did so I can learn more about the illustrative tide, see if it helps me breathe if it calms my innards, but I find domestic interior soothing like the sofa and its plush. Therapists have permanence in their furniture. I have shame that I share my sorrows and fears with the wrong people, except for my therapist, a kind grave digger excavating the figurative despair, helping me find the sweetest and bluest violets, the ones that counselors might not mention. I recount the flowers I continue to like despite what's outside of this window's frame. A troll government, an authoritarian we're trying to forget in here. The imperishable and perishable family. There was a husband father at one time, distinguished in phrases but not in gestures. There was a daughter circulating in vain attempts calculating the usage of efforts, I'm afraid to say. I painted her in pearly fabric amidst the lost husband father who blew up our foundation when he sought to line draw the exaggerations in our field, what were perished actions of the family. I thought to resuscitate it all and my cheeks blew inward. I was holding my, all my breath inside. This wasn't a good idea. So does this world spring from the imperishable, says the Upanishads, and led me to ask for a crystalline idiom, because in finding the daughter, I lost myself, I realized too late. I was granted tyranny for all the lost occasions. My therapist calls this manipulation. I decided to stake its claim. I will be done now. I knew I was the hat trick for them. And thus, I'm over with the game because the game has since been done with me. I had no idea until I blew and blew and blew. And I'll end with my last poem. A one, one. And it's A and then the number one and then W-O-N. In it, I found that the political discourse would love its ethical moon a wonderment, a one sum, bewitching affinities built upon antinomies, abstract, an expression, a wool cap of ornament for the sake of weather, loving him helpless anew helped, loving her helplessly anew helped, leaving it all behind helplessly helped, building around the moribund became a kind of blessing. I left constituents around the number one and I won and I felt simple or glad or finally incandescent and comfortably large in my honesty, a kind of hanging of the rituals, the clothes, 
the sense of living in them upright. I felt trouble pinging from my thumb muscles, but I ignored the throb. I looked out and into a dense and driven fog and said goodbye to its flavor. I said goodbye to more than 10 years of saying, will you please love me? I wanted to birth a kind of abstract expressionism of the merely objective and the racialized lover of things. One mint or ornament, or I want an ornament, or I loved an ornament, and the one mint of myself resolved. I resolved and thus I became into myself a one that I thought would never be allowed. And I moved outside of the fog into a place that signified art. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna try and unmute everybody so they can clap. Hold on a second. <laughs> um let's see did that work no it didn't work if you want to unmute and clap please do that was amazing <laughs> yeah. <Clapping> for everybody <laughs> Fugita, those new poems are fantastic so um we are transitioning now to q a uh so if you have any questions feel free to unmute and ask them or you can just drop them in the chat box and um i'll present them to um our, our poets tonight um we have an opening question here from rita um so you know in listening to each of your work you know there, there's i think a common thread in our work in that we are um exploring themes related to other art disciplines whether fashion music painting um how do other art disciplines inform your poetry or fiction how do you establish collaboration across art disciplines that's the first question Tim, it'd be really great to hear you talk about your collaboration with Rafaela in particular and how that came into being. Sure, definitely. Um, yeah, and I'm really curious to hear about other, you know, um, relationships um, across disciplines. So, um, yeah, with Rafaela, it happened very sort of um, randomly. The first thing was that I funded her Kickstarter. <laughs> And I, I pledged because she was building this instrument, um, which she literally created using a, a 3D printer. So she's like printing out um, this, this electroacoustic cello. And, um, you know, then at some point um, she was sort of like, hey, you know, wait a minute, you're a writer. Do you want to do you want to do something collaborative with this work? She was already sort of she had recorded an album with each of these tracks. And so we decided, yeah, why not? What's to lose, you know? Um, it can be like, you know, the stretch goal for the, for the Kickstarter um, can be something involving some writing perhaps. So um, she sent me the tracks and I just listened to them sort of on endless, this, in this endlessly looping way. And then um, I realized that I needed more. I needed more to work with in order to really sort of authentically engage with the music. I needed context. Um, and I'm sort of obsessed with music. It, it, you know, anyone who knows me, you know, knows that I'm, I'm sort of obsessed with music in general. I'm writing a novel on uh, contemporary classical music, um, which is how I met Raffaella to begin with. We met at, a, at Darmstadt in Germany, at, which is an avant-garde music festival uh, originally. So, um, but I realized I needed more. And so for each of the tracks, um, she sort of sent me her own notes. Um, and then we had conversations sort of back and forth and, and almost free associated together um, about these pieces. And, you know, I would say, oh, this, you know, this to me, this made me think of whales and outer space. <laughs> And she would tell me, oh, this came from, you know, um, you know, this particular style of music in, you know, um, in, in the case of Bayo of, uh, from Northeastern Brazil. And some of the stories, uh, so some of the pieces had associations which or very idiosyncratic. So she was, she used the word cheesy to describe you know, cheese-like to, to describe the texture of one of her pieces. And so 
that to me became a springboard to writing about a character who was vegan, um, who was betrayed by a friend who um, made her eat cheese um, and, and sort of that became, so like I would take this one element but then go back to the piece and listen to it again with, with this, these new ingredients each time, I guess. And eventually something would emerge and you know, I would share it with her and, and she was almost uniformly affirmative about and sort of just surprised because she was sending me these, these musical tracks and getting back something brand new um, and, and sort of vice versa. You know, each time then she would send me a, a new track, I would have something new to work with. Pegita, you want to talk about how your work intersects with music or contemporary visual arts at all? Oh, I just feel like you do, you do so much um, with that. I mean, I, I guess I'm just, I, I find it nourishing and it's helping to guide me right now. So abstract expressionism um, has always been a love of mine, but it, it just became more guiding in the last couple of years. So it is, it's, it's wonderful to relish in the things that you love and make them central. I feel like um, during the pandemic, it's definitely um, been challenging for me to write for a lot of different reasons. One of them being just um, the heaviness of the time that we're living in, but also having a seven-year-old. So I've kind of reduced like my sort of writing discipline, but um, I've been a little bit focused more on collaboration. This uh, British filmmaker who I'd met um, because I was jurying a video poetry prize um, found me online and um, wanted to propose the possibility of collaborating. And I typically work with people I know like for a long time who like live down the street or something. Like, like just, you know, it takes a number of years to kind of build that trust or relationship and ability to communicate with one another. And um, I was so dazzled and knocked out by his work, his technical excellence and the themes in it. And um, we kind of just, you know, had a couple Zoom calls and talked about um, something that we might like to make together. And that's how that piece title evolved. And um, I think we just, we started talking like in December, January. So it's a fairly new piece, but a, a lot of my work, just because I work a lot with musicians and authors and visual artists and in some of my past lives as an event producer or curator, um, I just have a lot of um, relationships with people working in other disciplines and have a lot of ongoing dialogues about like craft and discipline. And so these collaborations arise pretty organically, pretty naturally for me. Yeah. Lizzie, would you like to answer that question? Sure. Yeah, it's funny. I, I feel like I used to do a lot of collaborating with um, artists from a variety of disciplines and I haven't for that like, thinking about this question makes me realize that I, I just haven't in the last few years and I'm not really sure what that's about, but um, in the past, I, so I, when I first started writing, I was um, more invested in the spoken word scene and in that capacity, I did a lot of um, collaborations with other performing artists, with musicians and other spoken word artists and dancers. Um, and that was super fun. <laughs> um, and then as my writing got quieter, um, I did less of that. And I've, you know, but I've done other collaborations with, I did a collaboration with a sculptor who like um, incorporated my work into, into her sculptures. And I've done kind of back and forth collaborations with other visual artists where, you know, I sent my friend Jackie a poem and she, um, created art to it and vice versa. So we did had this kind of conversation going between her visual art and my, my words. Um, and lately, I think as I've kind of been like putting my focus on getting a book together, I've just done less and less of that. Um, but I still find, I, I come from a long line of visual artists. And so I find that that the I'm surrounded by like family artwork on all of my walls. And so that definitely 
um, can be a source of inspiration. Um, and also just other, you know, other writers, I, you know, I, when I get kind of stuck, I tend to just open a book of poetry and steal a line <laughs> and go from there. Um, it's something I do a lot of <laughs> when I need it. As a follow-up question, if I could just pose to, to the other readers, um, wondering if you can speak about the, the, because I like the way you describe being surrounded by, you know, this, this art, Lizzie, the way in which working with across medium allows for this unconscious influence, you know, there's this sort of conscious approach where you're really directly sort of taking in the, the film or the, you know, the, the piece of music or the visual work. But then I feel like there's also a way that, um, that getting outside of language allows for this unconscious influence to filter in. And I'm wondering if, if there are instances of that that you can identify in your work. Or if that's even a thing at all. I don't know. I, I don't know about in my work so much, but I will say that I've um, particularly this year during the pandemic, I found myself craving that kind of um, nonverbal expression or nonverbal influence more and more, um, which I'm a terrible visual artist. So that's not particularly helpful for me as <laughs> a maker of anything, but um but yeah, I've, I find it comforting to turn to um, when words get less and less accessible, if that makes sense, which I think they do in times of stress sometimes. I feel like I've learned a lot from like the vocabulary of my different um, creative collaborators. So um, like my own poetic compositional method hasn't been so much um, borrowing language from other writers. It's just something that um, is an approach that I've employed, but um, I feel like there are a couple of artists that I've worked with, painters and photographers who are actually using text in their work. Like there's so one photographer in New York who did this whole series about like sports and uh, masculinity. And he would actually like take pictures of, um, language in uh in in like beautiful type settings from like vintage sports manuals from like 1970s and it would have like these really amazing phrases like unnecessary roughness and all these languages of like penalties and sports and i became so enchanted with this other vocabulary that would never naturally come into like my own sort of language or usage and i felt like in working with certain visual artists this this particular photographer ferenc sito or a painter friend david lukowski i felt like um I was really enchanted by the language that they were using and then let it come into mind to sort of inform how I played with language. But um, I think that that's a way in which um, it's, it's, you know, certainly like the vocabulary or, or the sorts of imagery of visual artists and artists working in other medium, like they, they work their way into my consciousness, but I feel like there was like also a direct, a direct like language connection in the case of some of the artists I've worked with. I've just been thinking I had this old life with my late husband where he, you know, was a composer, an avant-garde composer, and we collaborated a lot in teaching and, and, and um, on some sound pieces, and um, also his daughter is a painter, and so I felt immersed in a world that I now have left behind, and so it's been interesting and challenging to kind of um, but I'm in a new in a new academic environment with a lot of intellectual stimulus to just figure out how to reinvent my interests for myself uh, to step out of my partner is not in the arts. And I find myself now a mediator to him. Um, but I think it's really interesting to figure out what um, what immersion looked like, like how unconscious it is, and then trying to make it more conscious in a different way for different reasons. So it's it's just interesting how life just ch changes its shape and you know you have to learn how to change with it. 
So we have a number of um, MFA writing and publishing students in the Zoom room, and I wonder if you know folks would be interested in hearing Lizzie's experiences of publishing her first book because she's a fairly recent alumni of BCFA, and that is something that writers starting out, you know, they have on their minds. And wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey to publishing with Finishing Line and putting together your manuscript. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um... I, when I started putting the manuscript together, I had no intention of doing it. <laughs> um, I was really focused coming out of my MFA on, on just continuing to hone the individual poems. I didn't feel like what I had was ready to be a collection and it, and it wasn't what I had at the time. Um, and I thought, you know, I'll take a couple of years and I'll just keep kind of honing these pieces or, you know, tweaking them or writing new work and see what comes together. Um, and I had the opportunity uh, to take a, like just a long weekend writing retreat at a local retreat center. Um, I had done some workshops for some of their participants and they gave me a free weekend in exchange, which was lovely. And I was there and I was writing and I was focused on my individual poems and on like the Sunday of this long weekend, like Sunday afternoon, I was like, just kind of hit me what, I kind of saw the poem Blue, how it could hold together some of the other work that I was doing. And I was like, oh, well, heck, I've got the time right now. Why don't I just play with it for fun? And I was just really emotionally not committed to uh, working on it at all but just wanted to play and see, see how those poems might come together. And I started, you know, arranging them. And by the end of the weekend, I was like, oh no, I'm doing this. I'm putting together a book. This is coming together. Um, and I spent the next two years really continuing to write new poems and swapping things out and adding things in and seeing new threads that would come together. Um, and I returned to campus for, there's a postgraduate writers conference that they hold in the summer. Um, and so I returned to campus for that and joined a, a manuscript workshop group where I was able to get a little more direction. Um, and that really helped me pull the manuscript together. And then I like gave myself the space to, um, pause in my writing practice to really just focus on submitting things. So focusing on submitting individual poems from the book so that I could to magazines to feel like I had enough out there to strategically then be able to send the manuscript out. Um, and working with Finishing Line was great. Um, they're a really, um, just a really supportive and flexible press. I mean, I think like they take suggestions really well. They take edits really well. Um, they let you find your own work for your cover and then make a beautiful design out of it. and and take suggestions on that really well, so, which was really important to me that the cover be kind of what I wanted. Um, yeah, I don't know if people want to hear more about that aspect, but um, it was really, I think for me, about giving myself to play with the idea of a manuscript and not feel like I had to do it. Um, and then giving myself permission to kind of pause in the writing, the writing practice so that I really had the space to focus on submitting the book and getting it out there. But now the trick is getting the writing practice going again. That's the hard part I'm finding. Questions from the audience, from students, from faculty? Um, I have one question, which is um, there's a number of uh, writers here who have uh, books out that came out during the pandemic. I mean, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. So what has it been like um, promoting your books or uh, what have you done to like, um, you know, do online readings or other kinds of ways that you get your words out there? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's been fun hosting people at Pomona and um, kind of just uh, just staying in touch with my poetry community and supporting each other. Um, I do know that um, several of my fiction writer friends have found um, communities that are actually just really trying to curate 
and develop reading series. So that seemed that, I mean, I think that's been happening in poetry too. So everybody's been kind of coming together, I guess. Um, mine came out in the fall of 2019, but I had a lot of things set up in the spring and they slowly disappeared. <laughs> so this was great. So the Zoom replaced it. I found that um, finding other ways to get the work out. So um, people with radio shows on public radio and um, approaching folks about having readings or conversations on their shows. Um, in my particular case, my book Enso comes with an audio package um, of both like essays that I recorded and read, but also their songs on it with a couple of um, musicians from the Pacific Northwest. So because those were pre-recorded and engineered, it just offered other really interesting material for that kind of format of um, working with sound or radio. So I feel like that was one thing. And yeah, Pragita has talked about hosting uh, visitors in her creative writing classes. And I feel like that has been really one of the more meaningful interactions that I've had with um, readers over the past year, just because um, my friends who are able to teach the book in their classes, you know, they're having their students read the work so closely with such attention, um, more than is usually typical, and then being able to engage young people in conversations about the work and the process has been, you know, tremendously meaningful and more meaningful than like doing like a poetry reading with like, I don't know, like 50 people in the room or something. I think it's also about like the quality of the reading or the reader. And um, that's been something that's been a, a great way to feel like the work is circulating in the world and reaching people and having an impact. Lizzie, would you like to answer that question since you're at the beginning of this book coming? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it feels early to have too much definitive, but so far, um, I'm really actually kind of loving the Zoom readings. Just, I mean, living in a rural state, I think I'm actually probably getting much better turnout than I would with live readings. Um, so those of you in rural areas, I think this is actually a great technique. Um, and, you know, and I think for me, it's just been a lot of social media time so far, um, which I think it probably would have been anyway, but um, so, yeah, just really honing those social media skills is going to be going to be your friend. <laughs> I'll say that I also host a poetry podcast for an organization in Seattle called Town Hall, and I was lucky enough to host Pragita um, earlier this April, uh, last April, almost a year ago, I think it was, with uh, Afroz Fatima Ahmed, who's a, a younger poet in the Washington State community, and had them have a really rich conversation around different kinds of grieving, not just um, of a, a loved one, but of uh, racial grief in particular, which felt really uh, potent with everything that was happening last spring. So I feel like also like coming to Zoom with unconventional formats, not necessarily just kind of um, uh, the, the you know, set readings that we might have live, you know, has been like a really fun way to innovate programming as well. That was a lot of fun. And I, I put the link in the chat like uh, way up. I can try and find it again and send it, put it in back again. Do other folks have questions? Um, great. If there are no questions, we'll begin wrapping up for this evening. Um, I just wanted to say, Shinny, to your last point, one thing I love about these Zoom call readings is that you can share all of these uh, different media and disciplines together. It's it's so interactive in a certain way and also interactive in the sense that people from all over the world are here, which is amazing. So um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you so much to our readers. Thank you to Shinyi Pai, our assistant director, Lizzie Fox, our former associate director, Pragita Sharma, a wonderful visiting writer in our program, and Tor Tim Horvath, one of our fiction faculty in our program. So thank you so much uh, for reading here with us tonight and being with us and answering our questions. I wanted to uh, give a little bit of a shout out to, about our next reading, which will happen on Friday, March uh, 19th from 
5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, in our uh, next reading, we will be featuring our faculty, Sean Prentice and Leslie Arima, so please come for that. And we will also be having our visiting writers, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and poet um, Douglas Kearney come. So please come to that reading. It's on Friday, March 19th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and if everyone would like to unmute for a moment, let's give a round of applause to all of our readers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone. Have a great night. I hope to see you all in person soon for real time. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes, absolutely. So Thank wonderful you. to read with you all.